freaking beater come off the head? Always, always let it come off so that you're not muting the drum. Okay, and losing bass. You lose bass when you leave a beater into a, a skin. So just train your foot to let the beater come off. Okay, man, plus you dent the head. Betty butter, butts and butter, but she said this butter's bitter. If I think this is a bit of butter, it will make my batter bitter, though a bit of better butter, that will make my batter bitter. So she bought a bit of butter, better than a bit of butter, and she baked it in the batter, and the batter was a bitter, so it's better. Betty butter, bought a bit of better butter. Try to come up, out, and then back in like that.
close, and close is good. Folks, uh, I'm talking today about the uh, right hand being so loud, often uh, with the symbols I find. Um, you know, we can easily kill the symbols, and that's cool, and it works for a lot of music and a lot of how you might feel uh, with certain music. But it's also, I think, another side of playing and of, of groove feel, especially to be able to, to use your dexterity of your strong limb to, to bring the volume down to the symbols because it's treble, and our ears hear those frequencies really well. So. Um, you know, if you're really coloring your picture too bright, I think you lose the shadows, you know, you lose the bass, you lose the the subtlety between the, the ghosts, you know, that's kind of a sin, I think, to lose the ghost notes in groove music, you know, because there's just too much overbearing hats happening. So when we start off on drums, a lot of the time you hear the right hand that everyone's got. Eventually, you just, I think, or should look to develop a, a quieter approach. Um, one thing that I really help with that is to, if you're ready, to hold the stick in a different way so you're not just overbearing. I, I find this really works with um, with the right hand. Uh, for example, instead of holding it in the traditional way, where you've got the you know hilt of the the stick. Um, I actually hold it like this quite often now. Uh, so the the support is coming from the ring finger, and I'm just able to play in this nice and light motion, relaxed back here. I've got a lot of length um, of the stick now in my favor, and it's just light. The, the stick is just happy to, to bounce along like that, you know? So, so that's a real help uh, for, for playing more quietly. So again, why are we playing quietly? Because we want to hear that the melody and the dialogue between the kick and the snare, you know, which goes way, way, way back. Those two voices, you know, at least a hundred years, uh, more even in Europe, if you're talking about the, the tradition of bass drums and snare drums. So I really want to honor that, um, the relationship that those guys have as the, as principal voices in a lot of the music that we're familiar with, you know. So the way to do that is, again, to bring the volume down uh, on your cymbals. test of how to approach that is to actually bring your right hand right out of it. So you can do a, a check-in on the volume of your ghosts, of uh, your roughs. And when you bring that hat back in, it serves as a, a through line in, in the groove music um, because we play eighth notes a lot, so it's really easy to to just um, to drive any groove with an eighth note. But again, it, the feel changes and weakens, in my opinion, a lot of the time when it's too loud. So you should match your ghosts, or it's a great ability to have, to match the, your ghosts to the same level as your hi-hat dynamically. Hitting the hats here, you can see I'm just moving the wrist just a little bit. 
uh, but I'm also engaging the bot, uh, both symbols on the hats. I'm never using just the tip of the stick on the hi-hat because it, it produces a thin, bright sound, which I just can't stand. You know, this is will produce the, the treble, um, the, the brightest sound that, you, that it can give you. So why add treble to treble? You know, it just makes everything brighter sounding. On the ride, I'll do um, a mute with the thumb. I don't know if you can see that, but I'll put a, the tip of my right thumb on the cymbal and I'll just hit the, I'll use the tip of the stick here. Just for a little more control. It's kind of a weird technique, but it's it involves this, this pushing down uh, and the index is on top of the stick as well. It's a really intimate, kind of a cool grip, but this you'll find if you try this out is the weird part and you have to get used to it. And obviously you have to, to want this as well, you know? So why would you ever want this? Um, if you're not playing with your plugs and you're in a really quiet setting, then I've found over the years that the tip of the stick on the ride is, it's only one sound, you know? And if you don't want so much wash, but you can't get away from it, and you certainly don't want to go to blast sticks or brushes, you still want to play with a tip with a drumstick, then a thumb mute, it just controls that wash a little bit better. thumb so it's a subtle thing but we're talking about subtleties here today so the strategy again for today is don't hit the cymbals any harder than they really need to um, get the drums to speak instead, you know, so so light your colors, light your your the contrast from the the bottom, you know, with the, with the darkness and with the shadows first and make that the focus because the brightness is really easy to 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 add in, you know, especially with a cymbal. So so it's it's really worth checking out. Like if when you hit a cymbal, it's um, you know, everyone can waste a cymbal, and it's really important to be able to hit a cymbal really hard uh, for certain kinds of music, and depending on the attitude of the music in the moment. Um, but if it's really quiet, then a cymbal is going to cut anyway. You know, a lot of engineers won't even mic; they won't even use overheads for cymbals. You know, uh, because they know that the mics are going to the the mics on the toms are going to pick up the cymbals, and the cymbals are going to just be heard in the room anyway. So you could hit a cymbal like you're giving a kid a high five. You know, it's a you touch the cymbal like. Ah, yeah, nice and easy. You don't hit the thing, so you get. So you're, it really doesn't take much to engage a symbol, and that means, I think, to hear the bottom of the symbol really speak and um, emerge and be heard, you know, and, and open up. Uh, anyway, so that's where I'm at with uh, some groove philosophy for you.
down to Havana and I was shown uh, Comparsa, uh, which I put on the kit. Comparsa is a uh, very festive old uh, type of street party music down in Cuba. And um, uh, Okay, we'll get into it later, but I'm going to show you the groove. It goes like this. going on here that's important. Number one is to get the different pitches out of one drum. Uh, obviously clave with the left hand over here which is felt in, in two bars, marked in two bars. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four. And three. Got the check it over here on um, I guess it's a half notes so one and three. One, two, three, four, one, two. This is a fast rhythm. Also it's uh, there's a lot of energy behind this rhythm. Um, the bombo note is it factors into the the this counter rhythm over here, um, second note of clave. So it's uh, the bombo is heart. It means heart. So one and two and three and four. It's the second one. It's on the end of two. So one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three. And, and I support that on the kick, which is of course what you should do uh, if you're on a drum set playing this stuff. So one and two. about this counter rhythm, uh, what's going on with the clave. It sounds like there's six against four. It's not, but that's another one of the sneaky little miracles of Afro-Cuban drumming, is you get, you, things happen that expand your your conception of what's possible. Actually, that's what happened for me anyway. So, um, you get one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four. up it sounds like it's a evenly spaced bunch of, of, of six over the four so and then you add the second bombo um, when it's it's at its rhythmic apex Again, that's not six, it's one and two and three and four and one. Uh, one and two and three and four and 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 one and two and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three. If we were in uh, 6A, say, um, I guess you could always superimpose uh, triplets, uh, what would they be, half note triplets over the, uh, half note triplets or quarter note triplets, half note triplets over the two bars of 4-4, four, four. Um, forget about that, maybe it's, if it's in 6-8, then I don't think Compasso would, would be in 6-8, I believe it's in 4, but um, uh, just to show you what six would actually sound like, you would get one, two, three, four, five, six, two, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, to give you your six, one, two, three, four, five, six, over two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. So these are quarter notes in the, the six, eight. There's, it's two bars long, so... Uh, three times two is six. So uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Ah! One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six. 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 It's a subtle shift. Um, the six eight against the f versus the four four, but uh, it's there. All right. Oh, and uh, for the hell of it, here's how David Garibaldi did uh, does his comparsa with the snare. Uh, there's two notes in here, which correspond.
respond to um, it's a rhythmic, uh, oh, sorry, a, a rumba signifier. It comes from Kinto, I believe, um, the the smallest conga or the second smallest conga drum, uh, which is why it factors into his part. I think. So we start off with about five minutes of this, just a spasm. Not trying to get them to single out too much, just getting the, the blood going to the ankles um, and just not playing from the hip flexors, but just getting the, getting the ankles moving as fast as possible. Once the burn starts to leave the shins, then I'll start to single out uh, just from the ankles. See how that's going. Then I'll pull back the tempo a little bit. So I'll get more power now, and I'm still in the sweet spot of the pedal with both feet. So a few minutes more of that, and then I'll bring in the hip flexors and more volume, and then start to slow it down. Bringing in a bit of uh, hip flexors now, shins are good and warmed up, the ankles too. Start to pull back the tempo a bit, bring in the hands.
200 is feeling. but that's just how it goes double bass sometimes. Uh, 210. percussion today uh, not using a lot of sticks it's just a lot of stuff I've learned over the years um, start with bongos so a little bit of Cuban percussion the bongos are actually uh, I find them really hard to play it's uh, what makes them hard is not just the patterns of phrasing is really difficult but it's the getting the sounds you play from the tip of the finger and you mute I don't know if you can see that but mute with the thumb so you get a, a really high popping sound it's more like up in there. And then there's mu uh, muted tones where you bury the, your, your hand into the drum. And this is true of a lot of Cuban percussion, uh, bata, congas. And there's the open tones, which is just the tips of the fingers, sometimes the sides of the fingers. So mobs. And then 
muted pop sounds. Uh, open tones and mutes. So bongo. Same kind of principle, except the open, um, uh, the slap is actually what I was shown when I was taught in Havana was uh, position, the position of your hands gives you the sound. I'm almost getting it in here. Uh, the only kind of drumming I can think that's more difficult than congas is uh, tabla, where it just takes um, just as many years to get anywhere, you know. Uh, there's a lot of sounds, but um, the well, the first thing you do with a conga is you actually tilt it down and away from you like that, so that you can get a little bit of the open uh, uh, sound from the the bass, so you can get the bass to to come out of the bottom of the drum. Otherwise, it's totally muted. So this just helps the drum to resonate a little bit. This is not like a djembe where it's it's a totally different kind of drum, and there's a lot of bass that factors into that sound. So uh, that slap is, you come right up close to the edge and you play uh, with a, a cupped hand right up in there so you get the high harmonic and partials of the, the drum resonating. So, and then there's your open tone and your slap, open, muff again. So you gotta try and get away from this perpendicular slap. You know, it's actually it's closer to the edge, like I'm saying. A really hard drum to play uh, because I remember seeing my doctor one time, and my pinky was numb, and he's got my arm, and we're trying to figure out like why my pinky is going numb. And I said, "Oh, I've been playing lots of congas," and he goes, uh, "Oh, so it's trauma," he said. "It's trauma." Anyway, uh, okay, congas you got, bell, bell is a blast, um, basically it's already very bright sounding and obviously very um, metallic sounding, um, so you gotta be careful that you're not overdoing it with, uh, you know, with a, a bright sound, there's already a lot of brightness in there, so what they do generally in Cuba is, well, this is designed for a drum set, so you take this guy off, uh, and they play with a bigger stick, like a round stick, like a part of a clave, and then they'll hold the the symbol here, or sorry, the the bell, just to help mute a little bit if if they want. And you've got your higher pitch and your lower. It's a different deal. Uh, there's a lot of clang sound, but that's a rounder, more pleasing tone than like uh, a stick. See how much thinner and brighter that is? You know, it's even more clangy. Maracas are really difficult um, because there's such a, a there's a, a pre-stroke sound bef before the actual the main accented hit. There's a little bit of of pre noise so you have to try to to work that out of your, from your technique so what I was shown is you actually throw pretty aggressively there's a, a, a bit of a, a snap to that and the other one I was taught that you hold them up here you're really like throwing, you know, like that. Uh, another grip is loosen the hands. You hold at the back of the hand, which is the, the bottom two fingers, and use the webbing or um, connective tissue, whatever this is, in your thumb, uh, between the thumb and the index.
very difficult. This is a gourd. This is hard. This one. Uh, you actually have to move both hands at the same time. And you really got to get this. That sound. Unfortunately, the accent is a involves a change of direction uh, from the down back to the up again on the downbeat. Now the guys who are really good at this, you'll see them moving the the hands against each other, and it's all very fluid and, and beautiful. Uh, in merengue, the um, metallic version of this is guida, but this is guido. These are African shakers I got in Africa, actually, and there's bottle caps in here. And like a lot of shakers, there's there's that pre-hit again. So you have to really measure what the what the shaker can give you. I don't know if you can really hear that because it's a really subtle sound. But you have to just explore the nature of each instrument and get really familiar with it. So this one, if I go to just shake it, I've got a sound where I don't necessarily want it, you know? They have single shot shakers that eliminate that problem of, of the pre-hit, I don't know what you call that, but there's really much way around that, you know? You can always do that, or you hit, you hit your wrist. And that can eliminate some of the pre sound that we're talking about or if you want want to use that sound a little bit and use the natural um, work with the motion of how you naturally want to move which is up and down then you train yourself to to get a sound uh, in both directions claves are really 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 great they're um, I think they I read that they were originally ship um, dowels, like like pieces of, of doweling uh, to keep ships together in shipbuilding. So you make a chamber, uh, which is just a Frenchy French, fa a fancy French word for room. Uh, so you make a little chamber in your hand, a resonating chamber, and the larger clave rests in not right on the tips of your fingers but close enough and you're just you're loose here you're not tight and you make a you make room for this thing to, to sit there and it feels better to let the other one come off the, the this clave come off but you really want to find where it's the most resonant see that doesn't sound so great but right in the middle sounds good and resonant and uh, there's a sweet spot you want to put the microphone let's say this is the microphone you don't want it to go to shake your downbeats into the mic because if your downbeats are accented um, usually by accident then you get a stronger uh, downbeat you get a chick 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 chick, chick which is on funky so the mic picks up that chick -dum, chick -dum. What you want actually is you go off axis or parallel. Um, is that parallel? No. This is perpendicular? No, that would be perfect. You just want to get on the side and get an even, um, even shakes happening. So you have to train your hand to get an even sound on the off beats when you're coming back towards you, which can be quite difficult. And uh, triplets as well in threes. Two, three, one, two, three, four. Shakers. Oh, these are really cool. Um, I saw a guy in uh, New York, uh, Carnegie Hall. He actually, because of that pre shake again, if you want to just accent downbeats, say, and nothing, you know, no offbeats uh, or upbeats, then. You still have sound before the actual downbeats, so how do you how did you get around that? He actually held them and hit his hand. Um, with shakers, you can sometimes mute them. 
squeeze on a little bit tighter to, to impede the resonating or the resonance. It's a different kind of sound when you mute it. And sometimes you can work that into the groove or whatever you're playing. It's a lot of fun to have more control over a shaker and just to bring it into your playing. Tambourine is actually very, very difficult. This one is um, built for the, uh, the, the drum set with this clamp, so you don't want that rattling too much. But the tambourine, you really have to get the, the offbeats um, as, as loud as the, as the downbeats. Again, it's the same old story, right? For an accent, it's just got to hit something. Obviously, a tambourine, there's a lot of different kinds of types of this and sizes, and it goes way back in history um, all over the world as an amazing instrument. It's an amazing combination of uh, a drum, usually with the skin on it, um, and a um, and little bells, little zills, you know. Wood block, you can. I saw one of the Nexus guys actually get real close to, to it and play it like that, which I thought was really, really cool. I don't know why he did that. Maybe he needed to be very precise with the hit in the time. I don't know. Talking about frame drums, uh, a lot of different kinds of these uh, ricks and tars and bendiers, and they're super old in uh, all over Africa, uh, the Middle East. Know, even in the United Kingdom, um, the Americas, and uh, Southern Italy has a great tradition of uh, their own frame drums, tarantella stuff. I think really big drums with cymbals in them. Again, you know, like little guys like that. Um, okay, I don't have uh, darbuka or um, uh, what are they called, tumbex, um, the Middle Eastern type of drums, but they uh, some of the technique with those drums actually apply to this stuff too where there's a they snap like that um, you can use your nails which I love to do with the frame drum there's the open tone um, there's some muffs and mutes there's a bass bass with the thumb a lot of this stuff applies to different uh, types of drums Rolling. You can roll with one hand, uh, which is the thumb and the, the other fingers. Like that roll would be um, the fourth and uh, pinky and the thumb. That definitely takes practice and you feel it in your forearm. It takes a while to develop that. You can do it on a different part of a drum as well. This will want to give me that. There you go. The frame drum and oh, triangles are actually really cool because you can. See, one side will be. See, that one will be dead, and so will that. So you have to hang on to it in the right place, and then you can mute.
Hey folks, talking about hard rock drumming today, heavy hitting, we want to do this for a long time. Uh, we've got a lot to talk about today um, in terms of feel, technique, setup, uh, what's involved, what it feels like to actually play this stuff for real. So, uh, here we go. First thing is you want to be loose. You know, these are just the things that I've learned uh, over the 20 years that I've been doing this, actually more than 20 years. Um, you want to be loose, like Angelo Dundee says to uh, to Muhammad Ali. He was a Muhammad Ali's trainer and George Foreman's. You don't want to be tight. You don't want to have um, feel constricted. You want to be loose when you're playing. Everything in this kind of music um, is exploding. It's the drums are being hit really hard, so everything is vibrating. You're not, you know, digging in and inhibiting the natural things that want to happen, like a head vibrating, a shell vibrating, both heads vibrating, cymbals uh, being very free to, you know, to explode and to crash. Um, anyhow, so you do, you do want to be loose. I'd be careful not to stretch. Like, you don't want to be uh, stretching. You just, you need to be loose all the time anyway, generally, right? So, um, so what I do is I just, I just shake, shake the arms. Michael Beauclair taught me this. Thank you, Michael. You just want to relax the muscles, get the blood flowing, breathe, you know, you don't want to be going, ah, you especially don't want to stretch if you're not warmed up, if you don't have uh, the blood going um, through the muscles and if your heart's at a really low rate, you know, um, so you need heat to really get the muscles to stretch anyway. Otherwise, I'm told it's like trying to stretch a cold elastic band, which is not a good idea. So anyway, um, the uh, speaking about muscles, um, one muscle is for this music that's really uh, gets used a lot is the thumb in here. So you you can kind of check in on that and just see how tight it is, or that's what I do anyway. But but generally you should be able to loosen everything up, you know, before um, you're playing. If not, then then um, stretch earlier, stretch a little bit before you play, um, just to help those muscles out because you're gonna need them. Um, earplugs. If you don't know how to put in earplugs, then and you're screwed. But um, if you're playing with big headphones, like up here, then when it gets time to actually get the stick up to the, you know, the bigger stick heights, then you can hit yourself in the in that headphone all the time, and that gets really annoying and distracting. And you don't want to be distracted uh, when you're playing this music. So with the plug, in case you don't know, you roll it up. Boom! This ear gets pulled up and then what I do is I actually twist and spiral and put the the plugs in that way. Um, I put band-aids on and then electrical tape. Um, you're gonna need you're gonna need tough hands for this. Don't use lotions and any kind of hand cream. You, you want hard, tough hands. Um, calluses are your friends. Um, the stick is is generating a ton of friction uh, with this kind of music, so you really want to um, protect your hands and just get them to where you need them, you know? So, in other words, you don't want to be aware or distracted by uh, any kind of pain in your hand that you could have avoided. So what I do is just take a band-aid and electrical tape and I just tape up the areas that I know I'm gonna, that are gonna need protecting. So for me, it's always the thumb. And the idea with this is it's on medium tight, like just snug. The band-aid is designed to stick to your skin. Electrical tape isn't. Um, but if I just left the band-aids on, then the stick and, and the sweat and the heat would just shear it off. So then I take the electrical and which is good and slippery. I put that medium snug, not too tight, not too loose, so that it's not gonna move at all. And if I'm putting, um, Actually, I, I do tape up the inside of my index in here as well. You can use sport tape as well. If I'm gonna, I, again, I do a Band-Aid and then this on top. Then I stretch it out so that it's not tight and so that I'm not aware of the the feeling of, of um, the tape too much. You know, a little bit of awareness is okay, but not distraction. I don't wanna be distracted by uh, how my hands feel, you know? Uh, I wanna be playing the music. So, okay, so we do that, and I keep extra band-aids and stuff on hand. 
drum keys in case stuff gets loose um, in the middle of playing. Um, don't stretch. Yeah, I drink water. I drink water before I start playing. The last thing you want to be doing is you want you don't want to be thirsty because when you're thirsty, your body is already dehydrated. So, so you want to drink. Uh, I don't know. I drink like half a maybe. 500 like half half a liter before playing um, you don't want to have to go to the bathroom while you're playing by the way but um, yeah so so drink well before you play for sure good pain and bad pain okay um, good pain is lactic acid going to the muscles uh, bad pain is numbness tingling Circulation is really, really important with this level of drum because it's so athletic. Uh, it's so fast. It's so aggressive. Um, your lungs are going to be pounding like crazy. Your heart is going at easily 160 beats a minute and staying at 160. You know, sometimes it just it gets ramped up like crazy and your juggler is pounding like crazy and you're just sweating like a freak and you're breathing really, really hard and it's awesome. Um, so that's the good stuff that's supposed to happen. Bad stuff is is cramping up. Uh, the oxygen isn't getting to the the muscles. Uh, your muscles are being overworked, or you're just you're tight. You're so tight that I guess you're inhibiting the blood flow. I don't know, but but you really have to monitor your own the tension in your uh, especially from the elbows down. You know, um, and uh, we'll get into technique in a sec, but um, but. If you're too tight all the time, then it actually creates a smaller sound because you're inhibiting the stick from vibrating and, and giving you uh, a, a full, um, you know, happy uh, reaction to everything that you're hitting. The cymbals, all that tension is going into a cymbal, so a cymbal is not as open as it could be. Same for a skin um, and everything. So, yeah, good pain versus bad pain. It's important to know the difference for sure. Um, let's talk about setup. Okay, I don't know if you can see this, but the the hats are like at my shoulder almost. They're actually a little bit under the shoulder, and the reason for that is I just want the elbow to be naturally in front of me here. I don't know if you can see that, but I don't want to have to do any weird stuff to get at the kit. It should all just be at the end of the stick, you know. And the hats are. The, the side of the hi-hat is it's like right in my face. It's not too close. I'm not crowding the kit. It's not too far away. It's certainly not low in the way, which is the worst thing you can do because then you're, you should never see the inside of a drummer's elbow. You know what I mean? There's no reason like when you're throwing a ball that you would let go of the ball at the, down here, you let go of it up here, right? So, so you want to be set up so that the stick is where you would let go of a ball. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so it's just right in there. It's the, the shoulder of the stick is where you want to hit stuff. You know, any symbol gets hit in here. This is the weakest part of the stick. And you don't use the tip unless you need it for rolling. You know, there's no reason why you should hit a uh, hi hat. You know with the tip of the stick unless you have no choice so when your hats are way down here then all you see is the top of the symbol and the rim this disappears it's no longer accessible to you which makes your rim shots basically impossible to get at so what happens is it changes your grip and you have to hit with the tip of the stick so you get a much thinner sound and it sounds weak it sounds like crap so also you'll see if you can see my left hand that is I'm getting this conflict happening here, right? So it's harder to actually get volume out of the snare because the hats are so low. So the first thing you got to do is get those hats up real, real high so that you can easily engage both cymbals and not just the top cymbal, you know, but you got to play in here, lift the hats up from the hip flexor, the, the muscle that, or a series of muscles that lifts up the whole leg. Uh, and and you're good to go from there, okay? But really loose in the hand. Uh, it's got to be a rim shot every time, folks. Sorry, but it can't be the tip of the stick in the middle of the drum 
because then you're missing out on all of this available volume that's naturally inherent in how the drum is made. So you hit a rim shot, which is the middle of the stick basically hitting the rim and the tip of the stick hitting the head at the same time. So here's 50%, here's the other 50, and together. You have to be able to do that at will, whenever you want. Both hands. Here's a quiet rim shot. Loud. Uh, what else? Talking about setup. So start with the throne. Uh, even before you do set up your hi-hat, I've got a little bit of uh, my knees are going up a little bit and it just helps me to feel for my center of gravity to be low, center of gravity, sorry, to be low, it, it helps me to hit harder, you know, it just feels like the drums are, they're across my, I guess, stomach, you know, and the stomach area is really, really important for feeling comfortable or for playing from the stomach really helps to to feel um, to give this music what it needs which is just a lot of aggression and a lot of volume you know without having to compensate with your back or without having to do any weird stuff with your hands you know in terms of the ergonomic um, relationship between you and and the kit so the rim of the drum is easily accessible to me here and they're you know I, I can live with the, the bass drum leg coming up and and me going to the rim uh, there being contact in here normally I wouldn't really I'd avoid that but because it's this kind of music then I just I work with it you know it's it's really not that big a deal but I would rather there be a little bit of, of touch between the bottom of the hand and the top of the leg if it enables me to to feel like this drum is in the proper place for this music, you know? So if, if it's too high, like say at the belly button level, then it feels like it's up in my chin and it that messes up my, my shoulder blade scapula in there. I, I don't wanna be aware of that stuff. I just wanna be able to hit well and to move properly, okay? Speaking of moving properly, um, so for that bass drum with hard rock, it's a, a one dimensional, uh, sound you know it's really not a dynamic um dynamically played drum it's not like jazz where you have a lot of different techniques with the kick and and you get a lot of different tones and you mute it and stuff like that no you hit it hard and you hit it from the the hip up here which is pretty close to your stomach anyway but um yeah you hit it for real so that the whole drum is engaged and, and both heads are vibrating and the shell is vibrating and the drum is it's happy and it's giving you all the volume that it can let the freaking beater come off the head always always let it come off so that you're not muting the drum okay and losing bass you lose bass when you leave a beater into a, a skin so just train your foot to let the beater come off okay <laughs> Man, plus you dent the head, ultimately. Um, what else? Okay, hands, elbows, from the forearm down, the shoulder down. Why do we hit so hard? Because the guitars are slamming loud. I'm, I'm already shouting because I have earplugs in and this is what you want, right? This is a very physical approach uh, to playing. Guitars are slamming loud, bass is slamming loud. Singer is screaming as hard as they can. And the worst thing you can do is be the the weakest link in terms of feel when those are the circumstances of the musical moment when the feel is that aggressive you know so you don't want to be playing with the tip of the stick when the guitars are just slam and slam and slam it loud um, you want to match the volume uh, you want to be too loud you want to be able to be too loud you want to be able to not be in the front of house mix because you're putting out so much volume from the kit. It's it's really a worthwhile ability to have, you know, and then you can choose to play quieter as an option versus, uh, you know, just being a consequence of your actual lack of technique and feel, right? Um, a snare drum, <clears throat> if it's got a pretty new head on it and will give you lots of attack and volume, 
if you hit it as hard as you can, there's a point where it just can't give you any more volume. And it's the same with the toms. You know, it's giving me a little bit more when I hit it with everything I've got, but not much. So you really have to monitor how hard you're hitting, um, uh, the ratio between how hard you're hitting and how much volume or more volume you're actually getting out. Because when you start to get tired, uh, you need to know why you're getting tired. Are you just out of shape? <clears throat> or are you not getting the volumes and the sounds that you actually need according to how hard you're hitting? So that's the stuff um, that I look for and I watch for when I'm playing in the moment, always. Uh, but a snare can give you 110, 115 decibels, you know, which will take your head off when you're hitting it hard. So, so we'll hi-hat, well they won't give you that much, but it's right next to your head, it's a lot of volume. The kick won't give you too much. It's a low frequency and they're they're down closer to the ground, but there's a lot of volume as it should be coming from, especially the snare, which should be your loudest. Uh, you gotta hit your kick with everything, like I'm saying, and then your your uh, your hat's gotta be able to pump out a good volume too. Okay, so um, for using the arms. You know, you can't really get away with too much with just the wrist. That's maximum rotation with the wrist. There's a lot of volume there, but it just doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel as natural as swinging your arms a little bit more. So, as with fighting, as with, um, yeah, mostly, mostly fighting, the elbows, the forearm comes up like this, like with boxing, uh, forearm comes up and you know, if you're really new to this, then what to aim for is just grab your earlobe to start, okay, to give you an idea of how your shoulder is going to feel and where the natural position of your arm wants to go. You know, so you just grab your earlobe and that's going to tell you how forward everything actually becomes, you know. So you really start to play from here with the elbows front. Notice that I'm sitting upright, but I'm not stiff like a board. Just want to have a little bit of a, a bend in there to feel like you're just starting to teeter over the kit. And that actually helps you to hit hard again. I don't know why, but it, it does. This just does not feel natural to have a straight back like that. It feels like you have to focus and concentrate on keeping a straight back, you know? Meanwhile, you don't want to be focused on too much. You want to be playing the music, you know? Um, elbows come up front and then look at the hand. So the hand's just naturally where it wants to go, right? You put a stick in there and the stick is, it's right at your shoulder. I know that when I don't feel this, when I don't feel the, the stick on the back of my shoulder right here, before I go to hit cymbals or hit drums, if I don't feel that little touch, then I know I'm not really hitting hard for real you know so that's another thing that you can start to get used to is is the the stick just touching here you know in the middle ages they would cut a guy in half apparently by using both arms going up and then you know use the sonic muscles um, you know there's so much energy just waiting for you to to use when you wind up like this and that's really what this is um, Speaking of, I want to talk about the conflict between the the hands when you're playing on the hi-hat. How do you get the left hand, sorry, the right hand out of the way of the left hand when you're going for that rim shot and when you're, when you're playing up here with the left hand? Why do you play from here? Because you need maximum volume out of the drum. Same with the right hand, maximum volume out of the hats. So what you do, or what I do, is I aim for the upbeat being, uh, I don't know, I guess this would be a, uh, one, yeah, it would be an upbeat. So at the end of two, at the end of two, the end of one, I'm sorry, the end of one, one, No, you know what? 
it's more like the uh of one. It's a sixteenth before beat two that I would be here, and a lot of drummers would actually be at the full, um, you know, wind up. So one E and a two E and a three E and a. So that should really help you to put to put uh, yourself in time. Uh, you have to uncross the hands like this. You want to really get away from the feeling of the right, the dominant limb, uh, like bearing down over the left and inhibiting the left arm, especially when you need volume from the snare real bad. Okay, so it starts in the wrists. You should just be able to uncross the sticks and point them like there's uh, flashlights straight up at the ceiling. You should be able to do that. And then with the elbows rotating, I don't know if you can see, but there's this, there's a twist happening and there's the up as well. And that gets the sticks out of each other's way. When you go to hit, I noticed that actually the, I have a slight circle in my hand and this just feels good. So it's this, I don't know what you would call it, but a slight ellipses or elliptical motion. It's a pretty narrow circle and it just feels good. It feels good in the shoulder to play like this. There's a slight twist that's happening. And I just think of, I'm gonna think of at all. I just try to come up, out, and then back in like that. So in, up and out, and then yeah. this area next to the head this is where the sticks should be sometimes your hands go up there i'll never forget seeing neil peart when he you know finally surrendered the traditional grip that he was doing uh i guess around the test for echo time and five years later six years later got back to you know hitting the drums for real. I remember seeing the Rush in concert and I was way at the back and I could still, from hundreds of feet away, I could see his left hand next to his head and it was such a relief to see that again, you know, because he's maxing out the, you can't hit any harder than that guy, you know, for example. So, so that's a beautiful thing. And the drums, uh, they give you everything they can when you're playing like that. Um, that brings me to, what was I gonna talk about? Uh, Technique, oh yeah, okay, uh, hitting as hard as you can. Well, um, I find that if I hit at 100% and I keep it at 100%, sorry, I cut out there for a sec, but uh, just one more point about um, about uh, hitting as hard as you can. Um, I actually learned that it's what works for me is to hit at 95%, to go at 95% and to keep that sustained in terms of a level of commitment to the moment with hard rock uh, because at a hundred percent then the wheels start to come off and uh, I start to actually become um, more inconsistent with the with where I'm able to hit the drums and cymbals and everything because the world is just shaking like a it's like being in a mosh pit where you just get flashes of the world you know because you're just so bent on on hitting as hard as you can so so um, that's actually a really important point, just to pull back a tiny, tiny bit, to have the limit, to know the limit. Um, but when it, it feels like uh, there's a loss of control that has entered into uh, your playing, then that's going to equate to a, a loss of uh, a feel and of, and of sound. So you really have to keep control of, um, of what you're doing all, all the time. You know, it's, it's a matter of pacing as well, too. So... Uh, otherwise you start to your hands connect with stuff it's harder to be consistent with uh, where you're placing your hands uh, you start to you know get injured more if that's the case and I don't know if I really talked about hitting knuckles uh, for example on the rim of the drum but uh, when you're up here and you're not consistently um, moving in the same way every time because you're just so you're just in a rage so much um, you can get into you know real kind of problem areas like you know uh, breaking a knuckle or something which I've never done but I'm sure I've come close um, 
it's it's just brutal to to hit a drum with your hand or the rim with your hand because you know it's a mistake is what it is anyway but um yeah, it's all part of uh, of playing this way and everything for sure but it it's there is a difference all i want to add was between uh staying at 100 percent all the time which actually tires you out faster than staying at 95 percent which just is really a different sort of maximum because if you're if you're at 95 you're in control then you can't actually give any more because you you lose control so it's it's just not worth it you know uh okay just wanted to interject that there okay sorry i got cut off uh but when you're breathing that hard your lungs are going like crazy and if you have a clammy wet shirt that's elasticized it's inhibiting it's it's tight so your shirt is tight against your lungs which want to go that way right out and your shirt is in problem solved where there's no shirt okay? it's not a looks thing it's uh it just feels really good it feels like oh what a relief right um other things i wanted to talk about positioning kick beater rim shots uh six shoulder in your head good pain versus bad pain uh hands are loose hat snare your plugs oh shoes some people play bare feet um there's a lot of bones in the top of your feet so when the beater comes back this is your foot this is the top of your foot this is the beater say when when this hits the drum and comes back and hits the top of your foot it hurts like hell because there's all it's bones there so you have to be careful that um you know to avoid that kind of thing for sure uh you have to be able to lift your whole leg up but keep the ball of your foot on the pedal so that you still know where that pedal is at all times obviously um sometimes the when things get crazy the the back of the beater can come back and and hit the inside of your of the ankle on your right foot of the your in, inner left ankle on your right foot that hurts like hell uh but this is some of the stuff that happens you know I hit myself in the face a billion times i hit that knuckle like we're talking about many many times um the with band-aids and the uh and tape or whatever technique you use to protect your hands um the reason you do that is so that you don't get blisters while you're playing because that is the worst what happens is the uh, you're playing the blister forms and then it breaks and then the skin a bunch of juice comes out and then the skin gets pushed off to the side and then all the 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 sweat in your hand and the salt stings like crazy and it's just raw exposed flesh there's no blood necessarily but it it's distracting you know <laughs> i put sticks right in my mouth you know i've hit myself in the hit myself in the back of the ear you know anyway what do you expect with this kind of music right um so yeah this is it's something to get used to is is playing up in here you have to want it you have to believe in it for sure um to develop those rim shots just start with the wrist and then start to get the stick going up in the hand and you don't want to be hanging on to the stick like that you want to be hanging on to the stick here a little more medium tight but from the back of the hand the back two fingers and these guys they listen to the stick you know can't think of another way to describe it but they're on the stick at all times you want to start to engage the elbow joint until Uh, and then eventually there when sticks break you should have sticks on the left side sticks on the right side uh, speaking of drumming muscles there's one in here in there so that's gonna get developed if it isn't for you already uh, forearm you can use a lot of forearm in here so this muscle which you can feel when you close your hand let me do that that gets used like crazy um and then this thumb one as well so that's the stuff that you really want to try and keep loose and 
and just and keep an eye on, you know, um, what else? We talked about the stick hitting the symbols, uh, the side of the symbol. You know, you want to be, you want to hit here, in there, you know, and then you hit it well. Don't leave the stick in the symbol. You want to hit it and go through it and come back away from it on a on that circle we talked about, that shallow circle, so that the symbol is just able to just explode, just erupt happily, which is what it's designed to do, you know? You don't want the tip coming in on the symbol like that. It gives you a very thin and doinky and lame sound, and that's no good. So you have to hit it, shoulder to the edge, right through. Positioning the symbol is at the end of the, the throw, right? Not too far away, not too close. It should just be comfortable. The left has to get at that snare, no problem. It's got to be able to get at the hat, no problem. The toms are just right at the end of the, the stroke as well. The, the floor should be um, at the same level as your snare, you know. The ride should be comfortable. It's, you should never be thinking about it because it's, you should be too busy playing the music because you're so comfortable. It, you shouldn't be wondering about whether something's in the right position. You know, um, if you need the bell, you should be able to get at the bell. If you need the, the surface of the ride, then you should be able to get there. So you'll notice that this is a really, really shallow angle of, God, I don't know, 15, 20 degrees. And if I, I want the rim real bad because I crash a ride all the time. One thing I do is I play rim shots. I play the this part of the stick on the cymbal. And that gets me away from playing for the tip again, which I don't want. What you're hearing is this hitting the ride like that. And it's not tight, it's loose. And there's still rebound. I need the bell, it's right up there. I want the, the, the edge, it's right there so when I can get everything I need from this symbol, no problem. I've got access to everything that it can give me, no problem. And it's not really the same with a crash. A crash, you just, you don't really need the bell at all, right? You don't need the surface of it. It's just it got one function. It just needs to be wasted. And um, it's the same with another crash over here. Uh, there's a slight shallow angle with these guys, and they're just at the end of the, the stroke, you know? I can't recommend having another crash enough over on the right side. These are 18s. These are, this is a pretty small size for me. I have a hard time playing a crash with this kind of music under uh, 19, um, because it's just, it's over to again quickly, you know? We need a, you need a big sound. So uh, I love to use a, um, two 19s, um, it, it's just awesome to have that. And I use both of the, the same symbols on either side, which actually sound different anyway, but um, uh, definitely a 14 inch snare, uh, 14 inch hats for sure, no smaller than a 22. Um, I'm in a, a studio with smaller sizes today, but for harder music, the preference for me is 24 kick, 13 rack, no smaller than a 12. Um, 16 over here I have a hard time with. It's just not big enough. So I would go 24, 13, 18, you know? It's actually a lot of fun to have two big, big floors, 16 and 18 over here. And if you want to tell me that you're happy with a 14 and 16, then have a great time, you know? Or a 10, uh, a 10 inch Tom on a hard rock set. It's just, it doesn't work. I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, um, what else? I, gotta breathe. I have the word breathe written on my toms. I breathe through the mouth. You need a lot of air. Uh, try not to hold your breath when you're drink fills um, or ever, because you just, you need all of the oxygen that you can get. Crash, 
it should be, you can't really see it from this angle, but you should be able to get at it, no problem. You should be able to hit a tom without hitting your crash, you know? So this guy is just a little bit over to the right from the crash. The crash access area there is just a little bit over from the snare rim where I would hit the snare. So you can see that where I hit the, the snare, but you probably can't see that, sorry, but is it's just to the left of where I would hit the, the tom, not by much. And all of that is just to the left where I hit the crash. And all of that is slightly, you know, uh, over a little bit more is the hat. So you get this, you can kind of see the, the angles here are really, it's all kind of close together, you know, but, but there's no fight, there's no conflict. Uh, I, I never hit a hi-hat on my way to hit a snare, you know. Which actually brings me to elbows, the whole question of elbows. Um, and if your elbows are up, I mean, guys would play this way a lot in the 90s and 80s, and Taylor Hawkins will still play like this a lot, and he does, he does this crazy thing where the, he's hit, hits the snare like this, and sits really low, and that's all awesome and everything, but um, if the elbows are up, then you better be aware of them being up because it turns your hands over, number one, and it really isolates your shoulders in a weird way. It makes you aware of your shoulders, I find, you know? The question is, do they really need to be up? You know, why, why are they up? Does it feel good? Well, that's good, but you really should not be aware of your back, you know? You should be aware of, of your shoulders. You, everything should just feel good. So uh, it's okay for your elbow to go up as part of a stroke, but they shouldn't stay up when you're playing, you know? Um, because it just, it's not normal, you know? If you're playing a djembe in a park, you don't go like this. You do with congas a little bit, your elbows come up a little bit. And I know in, um, in marching, drumming, the elbows go out, but the elbows don't stay out as you play. Just, you know, try for yourself and you'll see that it just doesn't feel right. So, uh, what else? When you hit a, a bell, no reason to hit the tip, you should hit the shoulder. Flams work really well when they're wide. Again, that's room shots all the way. guys have really flat toms and this area in here it feels like a tendon stretch like tendons are stretching when they're overextended there's no reason why you should have to get into this kind of problem area you know I mean I don't know why guys do this I've done it myself for sure but but the stick wants to hit something real bad around there, you know? Like, the palm of the hand, it's ready for contact about there. So, so is the stick, you know? This is just an extension of, of your arm, right? So if you're down here, then, you know, I guess it's okay, but you don't, I, there's still an angle here, right? Even though I'm flat at 90 degrees here, when there's a tom that's facing up down here like that, then the hand still has to go that way, which tightens this up when you start it back here. So I've seen this tons and tons of times and it's just, it's scary because you can do permanent damage for sure with this, you know? Uh, also, it might force you to, to want to be thumbs up a little bit and it's just, it just is weird, you know, to to max out um, a part of your body's limited rotation. You know, it just does not want want to rotate more than that. It's not designed to do that. So it's so easy just to twist and to relax and to hit the thing hard. You know, even better for you to have the, a drum up a little bit, you know, the toms up. There's a reason why most people have the same kind of setup because they played so many billions of hours. Um, it just works, you know. 
Okay, uh, wide flams. believe in this stuff you know I really really do uh, last point your snare has got to be opposite the core opposite your your belly button groin you know down in there um, and your your knee shouldn't have anything touching it on the right side or on the left side you know uh, you really got to be careful that you're not gonna step lift up that leg and then come banging down on some metal um, part of the drum, you know, or a tom leg or something weird like that. So you really got to protect your joints with this. Uh, and that goes for the left side as well. You don't want your, your inside of your left knee to be hitting um, a snare throw off, you know, or the, or anything. Your elbows should never hit a wall. They should, you should never touch anything with your elbows back here there should be nothing no amps or anything no contact around you you know this is really precious area behind you up in here and down so that you're not you don't screw yourself up all right have fun go slow repeat sweat uh, enjoy <laughs>